All right, what is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to Dungeons and Dragons. So basically, this little uh, recording I'm going to do is how we go around, go about, I should say, making a new character. All right. So in my games, when I have players join in the game, I ask them to make, to do what we call a stat block role. Okay. So how we do that is. So if you see here in the chat area down here, um, you will notice that there is a weird ass code over here, right? So what this is, is the method in which we pick stat blocks. So if I click enter there, that shows up, all right? Now in my games and a couple of other game, uh, friends games, we do a stat block roll code until we get a minimum of two 15s in that uh, that spread so as you can see I've got a 12 a 16 a 17 an 8 a 16 and a 14 which is absolutely batshit insane as that's an amazing stat roll the only negative I have is the 8 now once you roll your stats this is when you can decide what character you're going to make and the beauty of it is because I've picked this since, since I got that stat block roll code I can make any class of character that I wanted. So for the sake of this, let's um, let's make a, uh, you know what? Let's make a fighter. A fighter is the most basic um, uh, player character there is. Most new players, if they want to play a martial class, they will usually go for a fighter. So let's begin with abilities first. So in my games, we always go to custom. This way you can you can you can enter the, enter this uh, stat block roll code into your required stats. Now, as you can see here, it tells you what each ability score does. So strength, as you can see, measures national athleticism, bodily power, and it also tells you what's important for. So barbarians, fighters, and paladins. It also tells you what races get get bonuses to strength. So in this case, mountain dwarves, dragonborns, half orcs, and humans, and it tells you what the bonuses is depending on the um, race you pick. Again, dexterity, physical agility, reflexes, balance, and poise. Not really something interesting, but yeah. So this is important for the monk class, the ranger class, and the rogue class. And once again, it tells you what uh, races get bonuses for them. Constitution. That's your health, your stamina, and your vital force. So constitution dictates how much um, health you have as a player. And once again, the, uh, the different races that give increases to that. Intelligence, mental acuity, information recall, and analytical skill. And also magic casting if you're going to play a wizard or an artificer. All right. And once again, racial increases are there. Wisdom. This is great for your awareness, your intuition, insight, understanding what people are all about. And these are very important for clerics and druids and also for monks as well. Charisma, your confidence, your eloquence, and your ability to be a, to be a leader. And this is very important for bards, sorcerers, and warlocks. And also for paladins, because paladins use charisma as their spellcasting ability. And of course, as usual, racial increases. So. Like I said at the beginning, we're going to make a fighter. Now I am going to make a, you know what, let's make a melee fighter, all right? So if I'm going melee, you want strength to be your highest score, so I'll put a 17 there. Um, dexterity is always good, but actually you know what, uh, you know what, yeah, it's fine. So the dexterity we'll put at 16, constitution also at 16. Um, intelligence, will you, intelligence is usually what fighters would consider their dump stat unless you are specking into going into a Eldritch Knight or a Psy Warrior. But this is just going to be for the basic um, player's handbook uh, classes. All right. So intelligence will be 8. Uh, we'll put uh, 14 into wisdom and uh, 12 into charisma. All right. So this is how we determine our, our skill breakdown depending on the class that we pick. So immediately it tells you what's up here, what you've chosen. Then we go to class. 
So we decided to go fighter. So as a fighter, you gain proficiencies as with simple weapons and martial weapons. You also gain armor proficiencies in light, medium, heavy armor, and shields. Now at this point, um, when you pick a class or, um, or anything like that, you're asked to pick proficiencies. And I'll, I'll explain what those are once the sheet is made. So right off the bat, you want athletics because you want to be a strong dude. And uh, let's go for perception so you can keep an eye out and look around for uh, potential problems. Uh, fighting style. Uh, we will go for, um, let's go for, let's go for dueling. All right. So what that means, if you're wielding a melee weapon in one hand and no other weapons, you get a plus two damage to the rolls with that weapon. So if I have a shield and a sword, my sword has a plus two in terms of damage to it, which is great. Second wind is a feature that uh, fighters get at first level. So whenever you get harmed or take damage or something like that, on your turn, you can use your bonus action to regain 1d10 hit points plus your fighter level as well. So at level one, the max you can get is, is 11 in terms of healing for yourself. All right, and then once you finish this, you must finish a short or long rest, which I will get to once, again once the um, sheet is complete. Next, let's go to background. All right, so there are a variety of backgrounds that people can use. You can also make your own custom background, but, but always double check that with your dungeon master before you take one to make sure that they are okay with the fact that you're choosing that background. Now, backgrounds technically are just there to give you a, a backstory of sorts. So let me, let's, let's pick the most bog standard. Yeah, you know what, let's pick folk hero, okay? And immediately as a folk hero, you get access to skill proficiencies in animal handling and survival. And land vehicles. Land vehicles being uh, carts, uh, caravans, or anything, anything that travels across land that's quote unquote a vehicle, you have proficiency in, in using that. And I believe that also covers into horses as well. They also count as technically vehicles. Um, then you choose a tool set you want to be proficient in. Um, let's go for something interesting. Uh, you know what? Let's go with uh, Smith's tools. So you can make stuff. So certain backgrounds give you certain features. For example, this gives you rustic hospitality. So as it says, since you come from the ranks of the common folk, you fit amongst them with ease. You can find a place to hide, rest, or recuperate among the commoners unless you have shown yourself to be a danger to them. They will shield you from the law, or anyone else searching for you, though they will not risk their lives for you. This is a very handy tool when you're a player and you do something that's a little untoward. You know, maybe you accidentally kill somebody and you and the and the uh, the, the town guards are after you, and you just want to like hide away somewhere. And uh, if you're in a town that you are familiar with or people are familiar with you, they are more likely to help you out and you know let you be and they, they'll hide you and all that kind of stuff. But again, like I said, they will not risk their lives for you, but they will offer help. So, defining event. You pick from, you can either roll for it, right, right here, click roll, and it'll roll a random one for you, or you can do the drop-down menu and pick what you like. So, let's say, hmm, I see people during a natural disaster. That is the defining event. That is what made you into a hero. Of course, personality traits, ideal, bonds, and flaws. Now, again, there's a drop-down menu. Now, these things here, this is very uh, relative. It's more like if you choose the pre-written um, uh, choices, they are, some, they are choices that can define how you will play your character. So say, for example, let's say a personality trait. Um, if someone's, someone's in trouble, I'm always ready to help. So if you run into a, um, a non-player character or NPC, if you prefer, who is, excuse me, who's in trouble, they're being attacked, you will always jump to their defense. Even though sometimes it might be kind of problematic for you, like say you, you just finished a fight and you have little to no HP left or health points, I should say. Um, and 
a, uh, a townsfolk is under attack and you feel compelled to go and save them. That could be something that guides your character into a certain way of thinking and way of behaving. We always pick two personality traits. Um, you can use this as well. Again, this is all role play um, guides to help you work out your role play. So, you want to be a good person, you got to treat people with respect. Your bond, this is what ties you to who you are. So, you know, it's stuff that you, you long for, stuff that you wish for, stuff that you hope for. Um, let's go with, I work the land, I love the land, and I will protect said land. The flaw, however, this is supposed to be the counterpoint to your entire positivity of it all. So let's go, seriously, I believe things would be better if I was a tyrant. And of course, different backgrounds give you different starting equipment. So this can get a shovel, iron pot, common clothes, bell pouch, and a set of artisan's tools, which is what I picked here. So I picked Smith's tools. Uh, let's do equipment really quickly. So normally, what we all do is choose class equipment. This immediately tells you what your class will get. So in this case, I will pick chainmail because I want to be I, I want to be strong and upfront in the fight. I will pick a longsword in one hand, so I get dueling, and in my other hand, I will have my shield, which will up my my defense. If I want to do a little more um, ranged, like say for example, enemies far away, I want them to come at me. I can pick I can pick them off using my light crossbow to shoot at them. But again, light, remember, light crossbows will use dexterity, but luckily we have a good dexterity score, so we'll be pretty okay with that. The, the backpacks that you get options to, this is up to you as you want to do. If you're playing a, a very heavy um, dungeon crawly kind of game, where you are in the middle of a dungeon and you are just getting your entire situation to get to the bottom of the dungeon and find either the boss or some treasure, a dungeoner's pack would make more sense. However, if your campaign is spanning across a lot of land, an explorer's pack might be a little bit more interesting, potentially. But most of them have a lot of similar stuff. It's just certain things are different in that what it applies. Like, like a priest's pack will be different from an explorer's pack, and um, a scribe's pack will be different. There are different items, but all in all, there will be a bedroll. You will have rations. Uh, you will most likely have some rope, all other good stuff. And then, again, because of my background, so it says equipment for background because I'm a folk hero, I get to pick one more artisan's tools, which I will... You know what, let's go with, um, uh, you know, let's go with cook's utensils, so I can cook on the road. So whenever my party and I take a quick a little break in, in the middle of our, our adventure, I can use my cook's utensils and cook up some food and make people feel better. And just generally, because at the end of the day, you are role playing a character. You are not a, a pool of infinite stamina. You need rest, and you need to eat something, lest you become weak. And that's always something that uh, your, your dungeon master will tell you prior to your game starting. They'll tell you that I am putting in um, exhaustion rules. You have to take this much rest. You have to have some downtime. Please do eat some food, or you will suffer exhaustion and stuff like that. Okay. Um, let's. You know, now now might be a good time for us to go to race. Now, as you can see, I've got a metric fuck ton of races here. And this is because I have bought several of the books, which is why I'm able to have access to all of these things. Normally, you'd only have access to what's in what's uh, marked as PHB, which is the player's handbook. So normally, you'd have dragonborn, dwarves, gnomes, half elves, half orcs, halflings, humans. Uh, what else do we have? Anything else? No, oh, that's pretty much it. I believe those are the player's handbook uh, races. But since we are going to be, again, we're doing a bog standard situation, we're just going to go uh, human. Okay. Now we come to your race choices, your racial choices, I should say. Alignment. So alignment is once again a a guiding fact for how you will perform as a character. So these are the multiple choices, lawful good, neutral good, chaotic good, lawful neutral, neut true neutral, 
chaotic neutral, and then lawful evil, neutral evil, chaotic evil. Now, this will, th 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 this, like most, like most dungeon masters will never enforce alignment, although they should, because in the case, say you're making a cleric, or you're making a uh, druid, or you're making a paladin, or even a warlock, all of the, all these uh, these different classes they get their magic from an exterior source. Actually, no, druids don't count. Druids have their own inbuilt magic, but the other three um, they get their magic from elsewhere. So clerics and paladins get it from their deity. Their deity is the one who gives them their magic. So if you act against your deity's um, alignment, your deity will take away your ability to use magic or to do anything that's cool that you want to do. And for warlocks especially, if you are, if your patron who you choose is a evil character and you start doing good stuff with your magic, they might stop giving you their magic for you to use. Because you're essentially writing a contract with a otherworldly being. So I personally love the alignment system because it's a great way for people to keep people in line and a way to make sure that they act as they should as opposed to going absolutely batshit crazy. All right, so we're gonna go for a lawful good fighter. And because I'm a human, I get to pick another language and most and all the races can speak common. Common is basically English, all right? Now, these are your options for languages. So, abyssal, celestial, common, deep speech, draconic, Dwarvish, Elvish, Giant, Gnomish, Goblin, Halfling, Infernal, Orc, Primordial, Sylvan, and Undercommon. And if there is, like if you use, um, what do you say, a race that I don't have in my game, like say you want to find a homebrew race which someone put together, again, if you're going to pick a homebrew race, check with your dungeon master first before you choose said homebrew race. At which point then you can put in that they have they speak X language, which will then allow you to choose custom, and you can choose a custom language for yourself. Okay, so uh, let's go with, uh, or you know, common, let's pick, let's pick Elvish. Now, most races give you a sub-race option, all right? So for the humans, you get standard human, which means you get a plus one increase to all your scores, which means this is what my scores are gonna look like if I choose standard human. So humans get plus one to everything, all right? However, I like to choose variant human. And because I'm a variant human, I get to pick two classes, sorry, two um, skills that I can increase by one. So in this case, I will, I will up my strength and I will up my constitution. But the beauty of the situation is I also get to pick a new skill proficiency. So I get animal handling and survival from my background. And from my, from my class, I picked up athletics and perception. Now, in this case, I am going to choose, let's see, what makes a, what's a good idea? Um, let's pick insight for my ability to understand how people are behaving towards and how they're reacting to what I do and what I say. If someone's being, if someone's acting sus, you can just tell your DM, I want to roll an insight check on them. You roll your insight check, and then if you roll high enough, the DM will tell you that they seem shifty, or you know what, they're actually be, they're completely on the level. So that's all that's the way how that works. So this is how I have made my character as it stands. So again, box standard. Normally, in most games, people don't allow variant human because it can be a little bit broken, but I like the variant human because it gives you opportunities to make some really cool stuff. Okay, so that's the race situation. We've picked our class already. We've already gone with our ability score. We've already decided what we're gonna go with. We've chosen our background. We've chosen our equipment. Now spells. Because you're a fighter, you don't get spells at the beginning. So you can ignore that. Now here's the beauty of picking a variant human as your starting race. Variant humans get to choose two ability scores to increase by one. 
You get to pick one more proficiency in another skill, and you get to choose a feat. Now, because I have access to Eberron, I have access to Tasha's Cauldron to everything, Xanathar's Guide to everything, the Player's Handbook, the Dungeon Master's Guide, all these multiple different books, they all give you options for feats. Now, each feat gives you different bonuses. I don't know why that's happened, but fuck it. So, what will be good for a fighter who's using a shield and a sword? Because you want to be, you know, you want to be upfront and personal. Maybe you want to have some magic on you, potentially. So you can pick magic initiate as a feat. Now what this allows you to do, it allows you to choose a class, you pick. And you learn two cantrips from that class. In addition, you learn one first level spell from that same class as well. And some of these first level spells are actually very, very impressive. Like you can pick cleric, get two cantrips, say sacred flame and I don't know, maybe um, spare the dying, okay? And then you can pick up Healing Word as a spell that you have options, you have access to. But again, remember, if you're going to pick a spell, make sure you have the correct score to use them. So if you're going to use spell casting, it'll be between Intelligence, Wisdom, or Charisma to decide. So be careful if you choose to go that route. So I'm just going to go and pick up, uh, let's pick, you know what, let's pick Sentinel. Sentinel is a fantastic feat. So when you hit attack, when you hit a creature with an opportunity attack, the creature's speed becomes zero for the rest of the turn. If the creature provokes an opportunity attack from you, they, even if they take the disengage action with something that rogues can do, or even a normal, normal person can just use their action to disengage. I know I'm saying a lot of things, and I'll explain how action economy works in just a second. Like I say, I'll do a much more wider explanation once I finish making this character. So Sentinel is actually a phenomenal feat that I think everyone should get their hands on. So that's the feed I've chosen. Now we go to bio. This you can get back done later. So, but for the for the sake of this, let's do that right now. Um, he is going to be 36 years old. He is going to be um, five foot six, because I'm five foot six, weighing about let's say 60 kilograms, because I weigh 60 kilograms. Eyes will be brown. Hair will be black, and skin will be tan. Okay, but again, remember, this is stuff that you can do much later. Like, you don't have to enter this at all. The only thing that, only thing that would matter would be the character name. Everything else, it's up to you how you want to describe your character. Because normally, whenever you start a game, your dungeon master will go around the table, or in this case, around the browser, I guess, and ask you all to introduce your characters. An introduction means just a description of what you look like and your name. That's it. Nothing more than that. All right. So now we go to the review. So this allows you to see what everything you've chosen. So my race is human. My sub race is variant human. I have chosen the class is fighter. My fighting style is dueling. Uh, my ability scores have already been put into place. I've chosen the folk hero background. Um, I've got starting equipment based on my class and my background, which I've chosen. You guys saw that. I don't have access to spells, so it says the arcane is a mystery to you. I have picked the sentinel feat, and of course I've given my basic biography of what I look like. Alright, so, simple, straightforward, that's how you make a character in Dungeons and Dragons. Most of the time. This is how, at least, this is how I do it in my games. At which point you click apply changes, and hopefully the character sheet will not fuck up. And it'll properly, yes, fantastic. Normally it fucks up for me and I apologize for that. Okay, so right off the bat, as you can see here clearly, let me actually just up this up. Now, as you can see, we've chosen our class, fighter, level one, my background, folk hero, and it tells you basic stuff like that. The race you've chosen, the alignment you've chosen. Now experience points is something I don't play with in my games. I prefer using the milestone system because it takes away the video game aspect of it. Because when you use the experience point system, your players are more likely to rush to go and get into fights because they want to kill stuff and get experience points, therefore they can level up. Where as opposed to a milestone system where you basically award them levels based on their achievements in terms of role play or they've hit a story beat in your game, 
or they took down a massive boss who was a tough fight. You want to reward your players? As cool as magic items and all are, a level up is so much more valuable. But okay, so now let's get down to the nitty gritty of all this stuff, which I'm sure everyone's looking at and going, what the fuck does any of this mean? So let me walk you through this. Let's start um, at this area over here, all right, on the left side here. So this is the ability scores right here. So as I entered in, and you guys saw at the top when I was still in the character mancer, as what this is what the character creator does. My score is 18, 16, 17, 8, 14, and 12. Now, that's the scores I picked, right? Now you're probably asking me, what the hell are these giant ass numbers? Now those are what we call modifiers, all right? And I'll explain what modifiers are when we get to, basically, coming up now. So, we'll ignore this for a second. Let's go to proficiency bonus. When you start at level one, your proficiency bonus is always two. And after you reach certain levels, the proficiency bonus goes up, all right? <coughs> Excuse me. And I'll explain how those work as well. So, let's really let's move down to saving throws. Now, as a fighter, you gain access, you are, profi sorry, you are proficient in strength and constitution saving throws. Those are your best saving throws. Now, if you notice, charisma is one, my saving throw is one. So modifiers apply to these things, okay? So if charisma one, my saving throw is one. My wisdom is two, my wisdom saving throw is two. My intelligence is minus one, therefore my intelligence right here is minus one. Constitution is three, but you notice it's five now. And that's simple, because the tick mark means you're proficient in it, which means you get to add your proficiency bonus to that score, which is why at base, it'll be three. And because of my proficiency, it becomes five. And dexterity, three. Strength, four. Plus two, six. That's how that works. That's how modifiers work. All right? So they become very, very important. And again, I'll, you'll see why in just a second as well. Coming down to your skills. Now, most of these will be used outside of a fight. Okay? Um, so acrobatics, straightforward animal handling. If you have wild animals amongst your group or you meet a wolf or you meet um, a ravenous creature and you want to placate it or calm it down, your dungeon master will always ask you to roll an animal handling check. Arcana is your ability to understand magic. Athletics is, of course, what you can do athletic using your strength. Deception, well, again, most of these are extremely straightforward. History, for example, that can be used for you to recall information that you have witnessed or you might know, depending on your backstory or acts that you have done. Insight, of course, is what dictates your ability to understand if people are being truthful. Or... If someone's being sus, you can go, why are you being sus? Or you think they're be you're being sus, and you tell, if you tell your dungeon master, I want to roll insight on that guy to see if he's being sus or not. Your DM will say, very well, roll insight. And that's pretty much it. Um, intimidation, straightforward investigation, your ability to look around, look around for stuff. Um, medicine dictates your ability to understand wounds, understand, um, or even apply medicine. Like say you have a healer's kit, you can apply, or you have bandages, you can apply bandages to someone to, you know, to at least stop the bleeding, so to speak. Nature is your ability to look around and understand, well, you know, nature. It's your ability to understand a nature of something, in fact. Like, say you meet a creature, um, and you want to know what it's all about. Like, say you meet a vampire, but your player may not know it's a vampire, but you might but you see it biting something. Like, you know, like two, instead of you see two fangs and it just chomps into your teammate and you're just going, oh my God, what is that? Your DM will say, roll a nature check for you to understand what this creature is. You roll high enough, the DM will say, you, you have heard rumors of what is something that's called a vampire. It drinks blood and it's vulnerable to sunlight. Stuff like that. Like, depending on how high you roll, you might get more information that you bargain for. Perception. It's your ability to look around and understand your surroundings. Again. Extremely straightforward. Performance. Now, this is performance. I would say is purely something that happens completely out of a combat situation. 
like bards would love to have performance so when they go to uh, to taverns or inns they can perform using the performance skill and gain money to add to either their own coffers or to give to the um, party's coffers persuasion is your ability to talk people down either talk them into your side or talk them actually maybe talk them into your side essentially religion checks now this is when you are trying to understand um, something that's based in faith Again, pretty straightforward. Sleight of hand, your ability to sneakily, you know, steal something. Stealth, obvious. Survival is your ability to work out your surroundings, uh, find tracks, track down people, all that kind of stuff. Survival is great for that. Okay. Now, now we're going to move to the middle section. Okay, we're going to go to, in fact, middle and the top. So it's going to be these three things here. So you see armor class, initiative, and speed. So your armor class is based on what armor you're wearing. So in my case, I am wearing chainmail. Now chainmail by default gives you a 16 armor class, or in this case, from now on, I'll be referring to it, referring to it as AC. So 16 is the base um, armor class of chainmail. But because I have a shield and the shield gives me a plus two to my AC, my armor class is now 18. Now, what an armor class means is, so if say someone's going to make an attack against you. So, for example, let's use this longsword here. In fact, you know what? Let me turn on something really quickly. Enable 3D dice. Why am I using 3D dice? So, I'm going to attack. So, as you can see, I rolled a 16. But you notice the dice showed 16, while my longsword showed 22. What that means is, I'll come back to that in a second. So, for example, that 22 does hit. So, when you have an armor class of 18, if an enemy or somebody rolls a d20 plus their attack modifier, and if it, if it either matches or exceeds your armor class, that means you take damage. So, let me roll damage for this. I take, wow, that's pretty high for a level 1 character to do. But that's 10, that's 10 damage right off the bat against you. So, immediately, you would deduct 10 from this, which means I, I'm, sitting, I'm sitting pretty with 3 health. <laughs> for a fighter, that's terrible. But that's just how that works. Okay? So, that's how armor class works. Initiative. Now, initiative dictates when you will go into, when it will be your turn in a combat situation. So, let's say, for example, I bring up this turn order sheet here. And uh, I unfortunately don't have a token. You know what? Forget the turn order. Makes no sense. So, when you roll the initiative, once again, remember, this game is dictated by uh, D20 dice, which is a 20-sided die. So, whenever a combat situation begins, your dungeon master will ask you to roll for initiative. And I will roll. I got a natural 20 on my, on my initiative, and your initiative is dictated by your dexterity modifier, which is how that works out. So 3.16 is just for a tiebreaker's sake. Okay? Because say, because if I move this to 17, it still stays plus 3. However, the tiebreaker went up. So ignore the point 0.3. The point 0.3 is there only just in case people, if more than one player gets the same initiative, the tiebreaker is there to tell you who will go first or who will go second. So this will, so now I rolled a nat 20, or a nat, I rolled a nat 20, or we, or we call in the game a nat 20. So, 20, so a d20 plus 3.16. So 23.16 is my initiative, which most likely means I will be going first in combat, which is what you want to do as a fighter. You want to be the first into, first into a fight. So you can immediately dictate the pace of combat, okay? So that so basically initiative determines where you're going to be in the order of combat. Speed. Now, different races and some classes have different speeds. 30 means that you can move 
30 feet. In a normal game of D&D, you are put into a grid with squares. Each square is 5 feet. So if you're moving 30 feet, say, you can move 6 squares in any direction. Or if you, or you want to zigzag, you can, but again, it'll take up movement. But that's how that works. Okay, so that's how speed behaves. It lets you know how much you can move on your turn in combat. If you've been out of combat, it's free movement. You can move as much as you like. But in a combat situation, you can only move what your character can move. Coming down one level to hit points. So as you can see, it says current hit points. And this is determined by your hit dice. As a fighter, my hit dice is a d10. My constitution modifier is plus three. So by default, at level one, you will get max hit dice, which is 10, plus your constitution modifier, which is three. Therefore, my starting health will be 13, always. And that's true for every other class as well. Like so, sorcerers and wizards get a d6 for their hit dice. Um, paladins and fighters get a d10. The um, Barbarian gets a d12, and the other classes get a d8. And I'll explain how Hitai, Hitai works in just a second, okay? But that'll be your current hit points, and when you take, when, you, when, you, when an attack against, comes against you, which is either meets or exceeds your armor class, you then deduct that damage from your health. So for example, I did 10 damage there, I immediately remove this, I am now left with 3 health, which means I am on death's door essentially. Temporary hit points. Now these come into play usually when you have an ability that gives you temporary hit points or someone casts a spell which gives you temporary hit points. Now how temporary hit points works is let's say um, I'm going to be a samurai as my subclass which I have at level 3. I have a, an ability called fighting spirit. So when I use fighting spirit it gives me five temporary hit points instantly. Now how, tough, how temporary hit points work. So once again, say it's that same damage, which is 10 damage. What happens first though, whenever you take damage and you have temporary hit points, you deduct the temporary hit points first. And then, so 10's a damage, so five of that damage is removed from a temporary hit points, and the other five go into your normal hit, hit point pool. So if I can do math, I think that would be eight. So I'll have eight, hit, I'll have eight HP left. So temporary hit points is another buffer for you to survive should that you be under fire from a lot of targets, okay? Now we come to hit dice. So whenever, so when you guys are playing a campaign or a game, you will essentially have two moments of peace. One is a long rest, which is eight hours of in-game time, or a short rest, which is an hour of in-game time. Certain features or certain spellcasters regain their ability to use set abilities on a short rest. Now, let's say, let's say the fight is over and I'm left with three hit points left. And as a group, collective group, you guys decide Let's take a short rest. So, you decide to take a short rest. Your DM has you relax. Let's assume the Dungeon Master hasn't created a surprise uh, combat situation for you. And you guys get your full long, your, your full short rest. My apologies. At this point, say your cleric is out of, out of healing, healing spells. You no longer have any more potions to heal yourself with. This is the moment where you can use hit dice. So you will roll hit dice. So as you can see, it tells you the math right here. D3, so it's a D10 plus 3, which is your constitution modifier. So on the D10, I assume I rolled a 6. I did. I rolled a 6. Therefore, the plus 3, because of my constitution, I regain 9 hit points, which means I am nearly back up to full. But I lose that hit dice. Now you might be asking, how do you get those hit dice back? That's where a long rest comes into play. Now when you take a long rest, if you're a wizard, a sorcerer, a cleric, a druid, 
On a long rest, or Paladin for that matter, on a long rest, you regain your spell slots. And I'll tell you what those are a little later. Okay, we'll get to that. And on a short rest, sorry, on a long rest, you regain half of your maximum hit dice on per long rest. So say I have, uh, let's say, five. Five hit dice, and I've used them all on a short rest. Remember, you only get five hit dice when you hit level five. So as you level up, you gain more hit dice, depending on what level you are. So say I have five hit dice, and I've used them all to heal up. Now, if I take, so if I take a long rest, I gain back half. But you know half of five is 2.5. But in most in D&D, you always round down, which means I will only get back two hit dice on a long rest. So as in when you go along, you gain more. So every, so every long rest, again, you, you regain half your max. So if you take, if you take another eight-hour long rest, my hit dice goes back up to four as opposed to five. So be very careful when you're using hit dice, although at the same time, it can also, it also help your cleric, it can help save, save your cleric from having to heal you when you can just heal yourself, okay? Let's go back to default, which is one on one, because we're level ones. Then comes to death saving throws. Now, in this game, of fifth edition anyway at least, when you hit zero hit points, you fall unconscious, okay? So say you fall unconscious when it's not your turn. So say I had three hit points, like again, same example, I had three hit points left. I'm getting into a fight. I am barely hanging on, and it's my turn next, but the enemy in front of me, it's his turn currently. He hits me. Doesn't matter what damage he does. If, if it goes beyond three, I'm, I'm dropped to zero, which means I immediately fall unconscious. Now it's my turn. At this juncture, the DM will say, at the top of your turn, I need you to roll a death saving throw for me. So you will roll a d20. Now, death saving throw is the only thing that doesn't have any modifiers. Modifiers don't apply to this. Which is why it says death save and zero. Right there. So, 18. That's a success. So here's the thing. If you score a 2 to 9, you fail. Okay? If you score 10 to 19, you succeed. So if you get three successes, so you know what? Let's, let, let's roll this out. What's one success? That's two successes. Roll another one. That is three successes. You successfully saved three times. Now this will take three turns, lest somebody heals you or shoves a potion down your throat to heal you back up. But if you make three successes in a row, on a row, if you may, if you manage to get three successes, you get back up but with one hit point all right and vice versa if you get three failures you instantly die there is no coming back from it you're done normally like so say you are on one death save and the fight ends at this point someone can come and heal you or if it's a cleric they can you spare the dying which immediately means you're still unconscious but you no longer have to make death saving throws, okay? So that's how that works, back up to normal. Now, I, I, I believe you, I didn't mention ones or twenties. If you roll a one on your death saving throw, that's instantly two failures. That's the last thing you want as a player is to get two failures right off the bat, the moment you roll a death saving throw. However, if you roll a natural 20 on your death saving throw, you immediately get back up, but again, one hit point. That's how that death save situation works, okay? Now again, we already talked about this in the character creation menu. Now let's go to your attacks and spell casting. Now this is where, if you were a spell caster, like a wizard, sorcerer, warlock, or druid, this is where your spells would show up for you to use as attacks. But in this case, I am a fighter, I have no magic, 
Therefore, I am using a sword. Therefore, you only see a light so you see a long sword, which is one-handed, two-handed, and a light crossbow. Okay. So I am I, I'm a dueler because I've got one one weapon in my hand, therefore dueling applies. So you make sure you click that for a global damage modifier. So now you notice it says long sword, you see a plus six there, and then you see one d8 plus four. Okay. So let's look into this right here. This was a, this is the breakdown of how you do stuff. Long swords, by default of as a weapon, they do one d8 damage. Okay. They're also versatile, which is why they can be used two-handed. But for the sake of this, they are using one-handed. Therefore, it's a d8. That is the base of um, the sword. Now. Because I am proficient in the martial weapons, which is what a longsword is, you will click proficiency, which means your proficiency bonus is activated. And you're using strength as your attack. So it immediately means so it's four plus your proficiency bonus because you're proficient in the weapon. Therefore, your two hit attack is plus six. So whenever I roll a d20, as you can see, that's eight. So it'll be eight plus six, which will be 14. If that is the enemy's um, AC, Immediately I do damage and I can roll damage. So immediately I do 12 damage, which is huge for a level one player to be able to do. So I rolled what? A six again. So plus four. So it says 1d8 plus your strength, because you're using strength. Therefore, it'll be a plus four because of my strength modifier is four. Therefore, it'll be 1d8 plus four. So I rolled a six plus the four, which makes the, makes the damage 10. And because it's dueling, plus two, so which means my damage is now 12, okay? Because you're using a shield, the two-handed uh, thing doesn't come into play. Long swords are versatile, they can be used one-handed or two-handed, and if you use two-handed, the damage dice goes up to a d10. But once again, it still uses your strength modifier, so it goes to apply, again, once again, it's plus four. Light crossbow, ranged attack. So if you look at light crossbow stats, it's got a range of 80 to 320. So 80 feet away, you can hit the target no problem. 320, but if you go, if your target is beyond 80 feet from you, you will roll that attack at disadvantage, which means, in fact, I can just show it to you how, what, the, what that means in fact. So let's say I do that. So say the target is 90 feet away from me and I've used up all my movement to get within that much range. So he started off, um, Hella far, like he was, let's say, it doesn't matter, it's, it's a weird thing. So let's say he's 90 feet away from me. I've used my 30 feet to get close as possible, but he's still, despite moving 30 feet, my entire, my entire movement, he is still 90 feet away from me. And I still want to shoot him, I still want to attack him. So I will attack with disadvantage. What disadvantage means is this, you will see. You will roll two d20s. So in this case, seven and three. And because of my because it's a plus five to my attack, because it's proficiency plus my dexterity modifier, so it's plus five. Um, however, because of that, it's twelve and eight. So you notice this is this is uh, grayed out, and this is the roll I have to take. So basically, when you roll at disadvantage, you roll two d20 and you take the lower number. So in this case, I miss. My, whatever I'm attacking, most, most things don't have a very low armor class. So if their armor class is eight, that means they're stupidly weak and easy to kill. But in this case, eight on, generally would just miss anything you shoot at. So if you attack, if you're using, if you're using a ranged weapon, and the enemy is outside of your range, of your max, of, outside of your, your critical range, then you will roll at disadvantage. That's how that works. But remember, if you're going to use a light crossbow, uh, you can't use fighting style because it, it, it immediately states it has to be a melee weapon. So that's all of that. Now let's come to this little section over here. So as, you, as I mentioned in character creation, you get second wind as a fighter. So unfortunately, you can't click any of this. But if you're going to use 
In fact, you know what? This is a good time to talk about action economy. On your turn in combat, you can do three things. On your turn, I'm sorry. Three things. One, you can move, which will use your speed, so you can move whichever you want. Um, you can then use your action and a bonus action. These are the three things that you can do on your turn in combat. An action requires, so say you, you're, going to, you're going to attack with your sword, that will be your action. All right? Now say you took damage. Say I took, that, let's say I took uh, that, fuck it. You want, let's, let's say we took that 12 damage, which means I am down to one hit point. So what I'm going to do on my turn is I'm going to attack the enemy with my action. I'm going to use my bonus action to use second win, which can only be used as a bonus action. Which means then you go to this little handy um, dice roller for yourself. Or if you prefer, in roll 20, you can go slash roll 1d10. And because your level is 1, it'll be plus 1. You click enter, it'll roll the dice for you. Which immediately means, I just got back 10 health. So my health goes back to 11 from that one heal. Or if you, if you prefer to use this system, click on D10 here. It'll roll the dice for you. It's 4. Add 1. So 5. You heal for 5. Which means my HP will go to 6. Now, this, as you can see here, it says 1 and 1. Total is 1. Once you use this, it's done. You can't, use, you can't do it again until either, either you finish a short rest or a long rest. Which one I'm saying, certain features and skills become available again after a short or long rest. And this is one of those things that, you, that fighters can do. So if you, again, once again, if you don't want to make your, your uh, cleric heal you, make, make them use up a spell slot, you can use Second Wind to heal yourself. And as you level up, Second Wind becomes more and more valuable. All right? Crossbow bolts, you have a max of 20, you start with 20. Whenever you take a shot with a crossbow, remember to deduct your usage. Sometimes, after the fight's over, you can go, uh, Dungeon Master, I would like to go and find either more crossbow bolts or recover the ones that I used. At which point, he will ask you to make an investigation check. So you will roll investigation. So for example, as you can see the modifier is minus one. Whoops. So technically speaking, whenever people roll something by accident and they get two dice rolls, we take the first one as the score required. So as you realize, I rolled a natural one and because my investigation is minus one, I get a zero, which means I do not find my crossbow bolts or anything for that matter. I'm so, I'm so distracted that I don't find anything. But that is something that you can do, okay? Now let's come on over to here, this little section down here. So as you can see, passive perception. Now this will be based on, this is 10 plus your proficiency in perception. So if I remove this, it goes to 12. Because by default, wisdom, because, because wisdom is what uh, dictates your, your uh, perception. My passive wisdom, passive perception is 12. But because I'm, because I'm proficient, in perception, my passive wisdom is 14. Now, how passive perception works is the fact that, say someone is stealthing in the middle of a fight, a rogue or someone trying to hide, they will roll a stealth check. So let's, for example, let's roll stealth right now, see what happens. They rolled a 10 for their stealth. But because my passive perception is 14, I can see them. I know where they are. I rather I know where they went. So immediately means they are they are still within my vision. I know where they went. I can go find them, no problem. But if they roll, like let, let's assume they roll higher. Like let's try let's try something. What was that roll? Seventeen. There we go. Immediately I roll. Amazing. I call for it and I roll higher. So seventeen is their stealth. My passive perception is fourteen, which means I can no longer see them. So for for me to be able to try and pinpoint where they are. I will ask the dungeon master, 
can I roll perception to see if I can see them? The DM will say, sure, you can do that. So you roll perception. Roll the 16, unfortunately, which means I do not see them. All right? So that's how passive perception works. Now, down here are your proficiencies, stuff that you're good at. So as we agreed from the, um, excuse me, from the character creator, I am proficient in land vehicles and smith tools. And then of course, these are your armor proficiencies, as you should know. And sometimes you can add more, depending on how you train yourself. Like say, I want to be able, but then again, like honestly, between simple weapons and martial weapons, you cover the entire weapon spectrum. So nothing is out of your, 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 your used to, so excuse me, I'm really gassy. So nothing is out of your spectrum of being able to use. You can use everything. Pretty straightforward, pretty easy. But should you have doubts or questions, like say, can I use this uh, great club? Um, you ask the DM's like, so you ask the DM, can I use this great club? The DM says, do you have proficiency in, in simple weapons? You say, yes, I do. Melee means fantastic. You are, you can use this weapon, and you can be proficient in it. So say, let's say for example, you don't have access to martial weapons, like you are not proficient in martial weapons. What that means is, for when you attack something, you basically don't get the proficiency bonus. Which means it's only your strength, as of, and you don't, you don't get to add the plus two. That's basically what that means, all right? So, and it's very important, because you won't, you won't get that extra ability to hit something. You, you, might, you might hit, but you won't get that ability to maybe hit better, okay? Now we come to this. Your equipment. So as you can see here, got a belt pouch, close utensils, which I got from my background, chainmail for my equipment, long sword equipment, shield equipment, all that stuff, shovel. So the shovel, iron pot, common clothes, as far as fact, backpack, bedroll, mess kit, tinder box, all this comes because I chose to take the explorer's kit. Okay. So whatever items that you gain on your adventure, say you gain more stuff, you gain a, a new weapon, you add that to your inventory by clicking this, entering what it is, and of course, putting in its weight. Now, some DMs don't uh, work with encumbrance rules, but what encumbrance basically does is it causes you to move slower. It, you, you take penalties to your movement because you're carrying something heavy. And when you're carrying something heavy, you can get exhausted. So that's the important part that you need to be careful of or what you pick up. So your ability to carry shit is determined by your strength. Higher your strength, the more you can carry. But most DMs don't enforce that, some do. So ask your DM when you start a game, are you putting in encumbrance rules, okay? Next, features and traits. As you level up with your character, you will gain new features and traits that are part of your class. So let's quickly, you know, I'll just talk about it, fuck it. At level two, fighters get something called action surge, okay? Which means they get to use an extra attack on their turn if they use action surge, but they only action surge once per short rest. So say you're in a fight, you, you attack with your longsword. The creature is barely standing. It is the last one alive. And you attack it, but, you just, but then your, your hit just doesn't finish it off. It has maybe one HP left. You can just, and the best part of action surge, it is a free action to do. So you can just go, I hit it. Is it still standing? DM will be like, as far as you know, it's still standing. It's looking hurt, but he's standing. You can go, I'm going to use action surge to attack them again. They will say, all right, attack again. You, re you reduce the resource on your action surge and you get to attack one more time, which can then, of course, finish the creature, which means you've won the fight and you have survived the encounter. And then it'll say, you now have action surge. Or when you hit level five, you have extra attack, which means you can attack twice on your attack action. 
So these are the stuff that you will add or say you get new magic item that gives you certain effects. You can add that down into your features and traits as well. You can just click this button here, add what it is, what are you getting it from, and the description of said item or, or trait or feature, okay? I move over to the bio. Now this, in most games, is where people just put in notes. Like you put, you put character appearance should you wish to. But after a point, I mean, you know what you look like, why you have it written down. Unless you want to describe it to somebody for the first time, then have it there, no problem. If you want to put your backstory in here, you can. But mainly what people use this for is to put down their loot, um, or their uh, or information or notes they've taken about the world around them. They met a non-player character or NPC or a trader. They ask his name. What's your name? He says, my name is blah, 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 blah. You will add in blah, 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 blah of the blah, blah, blah shop. You can add whatever you like. All right. So this is basically a, this is a great place for you to make your notes. Now, for those of you, for those spellcasters out there who want to play a spellcaster, this will become everything that uh, you can think of. So let's go to the top right here. Because I'm a fighter, I don't have a spellcasting ability. If I was a wizard, that would be intelligence. If I was a paladin or a, or a bard or a warlock, that would be charisma. If I was a cleric or a druid, that would be uh, wisdom. So you see this word spell save DC. Now spell save DC is determined by eight plus your proficiency bonus plus your spellcasting ability modifier. So let's say I am a warlock, for example. So base eight, my proficiency bonus is two. So immediately 10 is your base, okay? My spellcasting ability is charisma, my modifier is plus one. Therefore, my spell save DC is 11. Now, what a spell save DC is, certain spells, have an extra condition to them. Let's say, for example, let's take Fireball, for example, the most popular spell of all time. Fireball is my spell. It, it involves a dexterity saving throw, okay? So the rules are as such. You fire, you throw a Fireball out, it does 8d6 damage, so that's eight six-headed dice. You roll that out, and if you're the one casting the spell, and, and like I said, if my spell save DC is 11, the enemies that I'm throwing it at have to make a dexterity saving throw. If they fail the saving throw, they take the full damage. But if they succeed the saving throw, so say they roll 11 or above, which means they succeed on it, they take half damage. So let's just quickly roll 8d6. So, 30 damage is what happens. Shit, that's actually very impressive. That's, that's, that's a lot of damage. But yeah, I rolled, so I, I rolled that. 30 damage is the effect. The spell save DC is 11. So they will roll a dexterity saving throw. So for example, let me just quickly do that right here. So I roll a dexterity saving throw. I rolled a 14, plus three, because that's my, that's my dex. Therefore, I immediately quickly save, which means I take half that damage, which is 15. Now, damage, just like hit dice or any other, or any other, most other rules when it comes to working out, so say it's 31 damage. Okay. Half of that is 15.5. You will take 15. You always round it down. Okay. There's no places are rounded down. Unless the spell says otherwise. Or the feature says otherwise. So that's how spell save DCs work. So you have multiple levels of casting. You have cantrips, which are free. They don't use any spell slots. And they are usually your bread and butter as a spellcaster when you're starting out. You will cast a spell like, um, I don't know, Firebolt or Eldritch Blast, or you'll use Sacred Flame, Toll the Dead. A lot of this stuff has, has saving throws, but that's beside the point. Those spells can be cast for free. 
So whenever you're, you, you will only use your spells for targets that are potentially very, very dangerous. Or you want to kill something really quickly, you will use a spell slot. Okay? So let's quickly do something right now. Let's level up. So I'm going to level up to three. Oops. So as you can see, level plus one, plus one. I'm going to level three. I get to choose an archetype. Let's choose Psy Warrior mainly so I can show you how spells work. So this is taking you, so you can, you can take an average HP roll, which is six, or you can roll for it. That worked out much better. So it'll be 17. All right, so it'll be seven plus three, so 10. And then, actually, wait, no, actually, that's kind of curious, actually. It'll be seven and 10, right, because it's 36. I had 13 before, now my score goes to 36. My bad, I'm very bad at math, which is weird for the moment, please, Dungeons and Dragons. So I picked Psy Warrior. Actually, I probably need to get a bit more, a bit higher. Actually, you know what? No, you know what? Let, let's, let's go to Elder's Knight instead. Because that gives you spells. So Elder's Knight. Click features. You get to see what your features are. Okay? And tells you what they all are. We haven't hit a level. We haven't hit a level where we can do anything. So let's go. Now we choose our spells. So when you choose this, you get to pick one cantrip. Oh, you can pick two cantrips, I'm sorry. So let's go Mind Sliver and I don't know. Mind Sliver and let's Fire, let's Firebolt. Firebolt, there we go. Bread and Butter. And you get to pick three spells. So, Chromatic Orb is fantastic. Again, don't make this a thing because you, as a, even though you may go Eldritch Knight, you may not have a great intelligence, you're better off just picking up buff spells. Okay? Um, sleep is always good. And uh, let's pick up, you know what? Shield. You see, we have three spells. Immediately when you do all this, you see the, you, you see the leveling system. So, I rolled max on that one. So, 7 plus 3, 10. 10 plus 3, 13. So, that's immediately 23. Added to my current hit points, which makes my current hit points to maximum to 36 when I hit level 3. And that's a fantastic roll, actually. So, let's apply changes. Now, level 3. So as you can see, because I chose Eldritch Knight, a, couple, a few new things have been added here. Uh, ignore the fact that this kind of, because the, the, the character sheet glitches sometimes, so ignore the class thing, but it tells you what your new features are and how they work. But like I said, go back to your spells. Okay, so. Immediately, as you can see, the spells have been added here into your attacks and spell cast. As long as these spells are a targeting spell, they usually will appear in your attacks and spell casting. So say I'm going to use Chromatic Orb. All right. Problem being, though, it'll use my Intelligence modifier for attacks. But because I have a minus one, and the proficiency is bad, so you can see here, my spell state DC is what? Nine. Because I'm terrible. <laughs> Should be 10, but minus 1, so 9. And my spell attack bonus is 1, because my intelligence is minus 1, proficiency bonus is part of it, therefore 2 minus 1, 1, that sort of thing. So immediately you can choose chromatic orb. Still pretty, pretty much hits though, because it's a plus 1 to hit. Oh, sorry. And at which point, it's at this point you pick what level you're going to cast a spell at. 
So when you choose to hit, you will, you, in fact, you will tell your DM, I am casting Chromatic Orb at X level. Being that you're a, being that you're a uh, Eldritch Knight, you only have access to level one spell slots, which means you have to pick a level one. So let's roll. Again, dueling does come into play here. But there you go. We rolled minimum damage on that. We rolled three ones. It's a 3d8. We rolled three ones for damage, which means we did three damage. That's terrible. But you get to choose if it's going to be acid, coal, fire, lightning, poison, or thunder damage. But that's stuff that you can do. That's how spellcasting works in this game. And when you use the sword, for example, at level, at level 3, we are given two level 1 spell slots. As you level up, you gain more levels and spell slots, as well as the amount of spell slots you have within each slot. So at level 3, with Eldritch Knight, you gain two first level spell slots. But whenever you use a spell, like shield or slave, see, I, okay, see I used Chromatic Orb. You immediately deduct this. So instantly, you are down one spell slot. And your spell slots do not come back until you finish a long rest. So be careful how you use your spell slots. Use them sparingly. They can really come in clutch. But be careful how you use them. But that is basically a breakdown of how the character sheet works and how to make a character in Dungeons & Dragons. I hope this video is informative for all you guys. Remember to leave a comment down below. Like the video, share the video, hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell, and I'll catch you guys next time. So from me to you guys, until next time, peace out.